Well, here we are on a Sunday night. Um, nothing much else to do, so figured might as well get this last lab in. I'm going to just do a little bit of the nervous system lab. So we're then set for this next, uh, uh, both the class as well as in the lab practical, which I'll talk about more. Um, anyway, most of this we've already probably pretty much covered, covered in the uh, in, uh, when we had the lecture discussion, but it's a pretty good idea to go over it again. I'll show you some more pictures and give you a little bit better idea as to where things might be. So let's just talk a little about the nervous system and some of the anatomical structures that are important system. Um, we had talked about this a little bit before. Uh, we know that what happens to the brain and the spinal cord are covered by membranes, and there's three membranes. The outer membrane is called the dura. The membrane that's below that is called the arachnoid, and then there's a membrane that's on the surface of the brain, which is called the pia. Uh, but there's a sort of like a pretty unique arrangement between those between those three. And so what happens is this is going to be, if let's just start here as this being our base, and that's our skull. So here's our skull. This is our skull right here. Here's the skull right here. I'm using a little pointer. I actually found that that's pretty good. So we start with the skull on the outside. And then we talked about this a little bit before, is that what happens is from the skull, the next layer down and attached to the inside of the skull is the dura, okay? And the dura is called dura because dura means durable, very hard, very firm, okay? Um, and so a dura is, means, is very thick, okay? The, the dural memory, I'll show you a picture of what it looks like in a few minutes, cadaver-wise. What happens is very thick. And the thing about the dura, no, the dura actually has two, whoops, that's not working very well has two layers, okay? And uh, there's and one and they're they're both stuck to the inside of the skull. Uh, and these layers are together. Every so often, as we see over in this area right here, that's where the dura will separate. When the dura separates, it creates a sinus. That's called the dural sinus. And I'll show you a picture of what the dural sinus actually looks like in a person. And that's filled with venous blood. That's how the blood gets actually back, like we talked about before in lecture, how the blood gets back uh, out, of the, out of the brain. Blood goes in through an artery. Everybody knows arteries go towards something, from the heart towards something to supply the blood supply. But when the blood comes back from that organ, back to the heart it has to go through veins. In the brain, there's really not as much of what we call a venous system. What happens is all these smaller um, uh, vessels will, will actually feed into this area called a venous sinus. And the venous sinus, then they all connect. There's a number of them inside the skull, which are basically just splits in the dura. And as a result, what happens is they all swing around and they finally come out through the area, that jugular foramen, like we talked about in class. So anyway, th that's the dura on the outside. So the dura is that membrane that we see uh, on the outside, it's a stuck the outside of everything. It's stuck to the uh, inside surface of the skull, two, two layers, and every so often it separates and creating that dural sinus like we talked about before. Okay, so that's that's uh, that's the dura, and again, it's, it's pretty tough. Okay, below the dura, okay, and there's the second layer of the dura that we have from the act as another little line right in here. Okay, well, you couldn't see it, but right here, there's another little line from the second portion of the dura. Stuck to the bottom side of the dura is called the arachnoid, okay? And that arachnoid mem membrane is, is attached. If we look at this picture right here, okay? And we look, see right here, they're sort of like together, okay? And they're, and, they're, and they're stuck together. So on the undersurface or the deep surface of the dura is this arachnoid. Now the arachnoid is not nearly as thick as the dura. It shows it very, you know, similar in size there. Um, it's not much more delicate, okay? But from the, from the arachnoid, we have all these little areas, these little strands that come down, like little web-like structures that'll come down from the arachnoid, okay? And it sort of like creates a space between the arachnoid and the deeper layer, which is called the pia, okay? And I'll talk about that. Anyway, so that's the arachnoid, okay? Between, and then the next area we have down in here that we should see is again called that subarachnoid space. Now that yellow line goes to the subarachnoid space. And this is the space that eventually gets filled with all the cerebral spinal fluid, filled in that space that's, that's inside there, okay? Then deep to that, we have the, the deepest layer. Now the deepest layer is called the pia. Pia is another word that just means delicate, and that pia is this layer right down in here. And what happens, it's out right on the surface of the brain, so it's a very fine, delicate layer that's on the surface of the brain. What happens is, again, 
between the pia here and the arachnoid membrane, this is up in here, there's that subarachnoid space that's in there, and that's what's filled with the cerebral spinal fluid. So I'm going to stick a needle in the back. And again, you got to remember those meninges like we talked about in, in the class, um, not just cover the brain, but they also follow all the way down to the spinal cord. Okay. And so when people get a, get a spinal tap or a lumbar puncture, they take the needle, the needle is going to go in through the area of the dura and gets in the subarachnoid space. When it gets the subarachnoid space, it's going to take the fluid out through the subarachnoid space. Okay, so those are the, the layers. The dura is so stuck to the inside of the skull. Okay, uh, thick, hard, durable. Uh, stuck to the undersurface of the dura is the arachnoid. Thinner. From there, there's a web-like structure that will connect the arachnoid to the deepest layer, which is on the surface of the brain, which is called the pia. And that layer between the arachnoid and the pia is called the sub, because sub means below subarachnoid space. Okay, so that's the way these membranes are actually arranged. And then this down here, obviously, would be the brain here and the brain tissue in there. Okay, and let's go on from there. We see that, again. We see the very same thing if we look here on the spinal cord representation. So here, so we have our spinal cord sitting right in here, okay. And then on the outside, you'll actually see the dura is going to be attached. So it's sort of on the outside. There's this membrane right there, and that's going to be the dura underneath. I don't. This picture is a little bit off because the erect the, the arachnoid membrane, okay. The arachnoid membrane is going to be just deep to that, okay, and it's stuck to the undersurface, and then deep to that we have the pia, which is a little bit below that, right on the surface of the spinal cord, and again, you can see in this area right in here is where that subarachnoid space would be, and that's the area that fills with the, the cerebral spinal fluid, okay, so that's what we see with that. Now, this is just a cadaver uh, specimen showing what they've done is they've cut the skull, so the skull is up in here, skull comes around this way, skull has been cut this way, so it's cut off like a quarter of that. This right here would be actually the, the, the dura, okay, which has been separated or, or, or peeled off this portion of the skull. So to get, so to get the portion of the skull off that's there, they actually have to take the, to have to sort of like, uh, sort of like a shell the, um, the dura uh, away from it. So this is the dura that we see on the outside, a very thick, durable, uh, durable membrane. You can see how it says dura over here. So that's all the dura that's inside there. You can't see much of the brain because that dura is actually quite thick, very thick sub, uh, substance. Now, I mentioned before about how that dura will split every so often. And if we look right in here, you see it looks like a vein that sits right in there, but that's not the vein. That's where those two layers of the dura split that creates that, that dural sinus, and the dural sinus just fills up with venous blood. Venous blood. Okay, and that's just, and then eventually what happens goes to the back. We talked and showed in lab how it goes down that S-shaped like ramp on the back of the skull, which is called the sigmoid sinus of the dural sinus, and then and exits right where the jugular um, uh, foramen is at the base of the skull. And once that blood gets to the jugular foramen, once it goes on, the jugular starts right there from that point on. So this is basically what we see with a, this, this, is, called, this is called the superior sagittal sinus, because this is on a sagittal line, it's on the top. It goes right along the whole top, okay, of the brain, and that's called the superior sagittal sinus. It's just a venous sinus that we talked about. This is, again, now what they've done here is they've actually taken on the, on this side over here, okay, they've actually looked and what they've, they've, they've actually split the area of the Iraq, of the, of the dura. So you see this little flap of dura that's being pulled back this way and they've actually stripped away the arachnoid which is underneath that. So over here you can see the dura sitting right here, okay, and the, uh, uh, actually you see, if you look right here, it sees superior sagittal sinus, see how it's split? when it goes up to where that, that pointer is, you see how it's split? That's because, again, those two layers of the dura are split to create that, that sinus. You see the dura that lines inside, okay? So as a result, this right here is still the arachnoid that's on the surface of the brain. It says arachnoid here, it's on the surface of the brain. And usually it, it's, it's I can't say it's firmly attached to the dura, it's sort of lightly attached, because uh, sometimes people get what's called a subdural hematoma. When they get that subdural hematoma, there'll be a rip in that area of that dural sinus, and then the blood fills, whoops, the blood fills in that area, the gap, because it's it's together, but it's not really tremendously adherent. It allows the pressure of the of the venous bloods allows the two two layers to sort of move away from each other, and then the blood will collect underneath the area of the dura, which would be called a subdural hematoma.
problem okay now this is just looking at the brain again now this is we talked about this in the lecture so this is anterior out here this would be anterior was not drawn too well here's posterior and this is that longitudinal fissure that's coming straight up the middle of the brain what they've done is this is still the arachnoid the arachnoid is still on the brain here and they've taken the arachnoid over here and this is the pia Okay, that would be the area of the pia, which is again very fine, very delicate. If you take a pair of pickups or tweezers and grabbed it and pulled, you get this little wispy-like membrane that would come off. So that would be the pia. Now, when we look at the brain, okay, now we've divided the brain along that longitudinal fissure. Now let's look at the half of the brain. We talked about this in the class as well. And what happens is um, uh, that the brain's divided into in each, si each side, you know, each, each part, each half, one half and the right half, they're called hemispheres, just like the hemisphere, you know, of the world. They have the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. Everything on the right side is the right hemisphere. Everything on the left is the left hemisphere. Split by that longitudinal fissure that runs from front to back, or back to front, depends upon how you look at things, okay? Whether you're standing behind it, whether you're standing in front. What happens is we could divide the brain into these four lobes on each side. This front, the one in the front, the one we see on the front, or this is, first of all, what divides the, 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 the brain, uh, the, you know, from front to back is what's called the central sulcus. Now, um, anatomy books will show you that this is a nice, very fine line, very detailed line. Um, if you actually look at a real brain, it's not quite always that clear. Sometimes it's a little fuzzy as to where that goes. It's not quite that straight. Sometimes it's a little more jagged. Sometimes you have to sort of make up your, uh, use your imagination a little bit to figure out where that is. But that central sulcus divides the front portion of the brain or the anterior from the area of the posterior, okay? And that anterior portion of the brain in here, this area up in the front, okay, in front of that, it would be called the frontal lobe, okay? Now that frontal lobe has a number of things. We talked about that in class, about the number of things that are there. there. You know, broca speech area would be right in here. There's a gustatory center that's gonna be right there. But the most important thing that we should talk about in regards to that frontal lobe is this area right here that's in blue, this area right here, okay? And that is the, pre, that's the motor cortex. It's, it's called, um, again, humps are called a gyrus. The, the creases are called a sulcus. That's called the pre- central gyrus, pre-central gyrus. Remember that, pre-central gyrus. And what happens, pre means in front of or before, central, here's my central, gyrus means it's that home. So that's the pre-central gyrus, and that's what we call a primary motor cortex, the primary motor cortex. So all my motor activity starts at that area, in that primary motor cortex. There's another little area that we could actually see that would be out in this area, just in front of it, which is a secondary motor cor cortex, or an accessory motor cortex. So sometimes it sort of assists that primary cortex, or if that primary cortex is, has a problem, sometimes that secondary cortex could take over a little bit. It's not quite as good as it otherwise would, but that would be my area of my uh, uh, secondary cortex if you know if, if, if it was needed for one reason or another. Okay, so let's go on from there and look what happens behind. Now, once I go posterior to that central sulcus, this area in here, okay, the area in here is called the pri. Oops. I should take that away. I went a little bit too far, a little bit too aggressive with my, with my, this area in here is the parietal lobe. So everything posterior to the central sulcus back in here, back to about here is called the parietal lobe, okay? And that parietal lobe has a very important area in that parietal lobe, which is gonna be what's called my primary somatosensory area. So here's my sensation, my sensation area. Let me get to do, do a different color here. My sensation is gonna be in this band it's called the post-central gyrus. Post, after, central, central sulcus, gyrus, hump, okay? So that's where my primary somatosensory area is, that where when I feel something, all those sensations will come back to this area of the brain, right in here. Then there's also a second area, just like that motor area that would be right behind it, which is a secondary somatosensory area, okay? There's something back in here called Wernicke's area, which is also another um, sensory speech, where in other words, sometimes people, are, uh, the brocas that was up in the front, in the frontal lobe, is, is motor. It's sort of how my mouth works and my tongue, it coordinates all that stuff. This Wernicke's, which is back in here, is basically more for putting 
words together, um, uh, right words in the right place, things like that. Okay, and that's what we see with the uh, Wernicke's. And then what happens is, is so I got my, but it, but still the most important thing is still going to be my primary somatosensory area right there. My third lobe is down here, and that's the temporal lobe. Okay, and that temporal lobe in this area, let me draw a different color. Let's do purple. My temporal lobe down here, okay, is important for a couple things. Uh, sometimes uh, it does, um, be, it's, it is associated with things like awakeness and alertness. R deep down there, if I took a took a um, uh, a pin and stuck it in right here, straight through, I'd eventually get to some of the deeper centers like the hypothalamus and the thalamus that might be also very important in awakeness and alertness and stuff like that. But a lot of things that sit down here is called the limbic system. We didn't talk about it, but it's called the limbic system, which has how I respond to things, how much I'm awake, alert, stuff like that, sleep, wake, cycles, and stuff like that. And that's my temporal lobe. My temporal lobe, because it's also right by the ear okay is going to be uh for hearing so we'll have hearing as well as balance and a little bit of balances in there uh cerebellum is going to be involved in balance as well but we got a lot of our hearing in that area of the temporal lobe and that's going to be that's what's called the temporal lobe at that point so let's get rid of all this other garbage up in here let's get rid of that and let's go into the last of the four lobes and that's going to be my occipital lobe my occipital lobe is right in the back now It'd be nice if there's actually a nice sulcus that divides that, but again, where that central sulcus sometimes isn't quite as clear, the, the, the one that divides the parietal lobe here, the parietal lobe here from the occipital lobe is even less apparent. But we say that this area back here is my occipital lobe. It's where my primary visual cortex is, which is usually tucked between that longitudinal fissure deep back inside, and a lot of these are secondary visual areas that we actually are able to see with as well. So that's my occipital lobe there in the back that we have, okay? Let's get rid of all these, you know, that's, that's, which is anterior and posterior and stuff like that. So that's that, okay? Uh, the cerebellum. The cerebellum is really important because what it's involved with is involved with things like balance, uh, uh, some with, with coordination and stuff like that. We talked about this in, in the lecture that the, the signals that come from the area of the motor cortex, okay, things that come from the areas of the motor cortex up in here are very very gross, very crude. And what happens is the lower centers such as the uh, uh, the basal ganglia, which you talked about in the lecture, the cerebellum and stuff like that, a lot of these things are important in trying to modulate how that coarseness of that signal is. So it, instead of taking something that's very abrupt and very uncoordinated, it sort of coordinates it down. It's, it sort of chills it out, okay? So the cerebellum, we might say it's a chill area, okay? So it chills things out a little bit in that cerebellum, okay? And that's what the cerebellum does. Again, this is just looking at a number of areas. Now, we're, we've actually cut the brain, so we're looking at it in the inside. And let's just say where these some of these parts are, okay? If I look up in here, again, here's the frontal lobe, okay? We see it where it points up, and my frontal lobe is going to be this area in here, all the things we talked about before for the outside. So that would be the area of the frontal lobe, okay? If I look at the next thing, here's the parietal lobe. So the parietal lobe is going to be in this area right in here, okay? We talked about where that is in that cerebral hemisphere. Occipital lobe, occipital lobe is going to be back in this area. So there's my occipital lobe. We can't see much of the temporal lobe because we're, we've cut it down the middle. This is like if we took the longitudinal fissure and cut it. We know that the temporal lobes are sitting laterally, okay? So you actually see a little bit of that temporal lobe sort of like sitting out here on this side, out in there, and that would be the temporal lobe. So we really can't see a whole lot of the temporal lobe at that point. Let me get rid of these other little lines here, undraw them. That would be the temporal lobe, okay, where that would be at. Uh, the cerebellum. Cerebellum is this whole area back in here. If I look at this whole area back in here, it's a cerebellum. Cerebellum also comes in hemispheres. It's split into a right cerebellum and a left cerebellum as well, okay? So that's the cerebellum. Balance, coordination, things like that are really important in, in regards to the cerebellum, okay? Uh, next area we want to talk about is the thalamus, okay? When I look at the thalamus, the thalamus is this area in here. This would be the area of the thalamus. The thalamus, like we talked about in the, in, the, in the lecture, is a relay station. Signals come, either come to or leave the brain. Either they're leaving the brain through that or they're coming through. It's like a final processing or processing or initial processing, okay? It's sort of like customs, okay? If you're, if you're leaving, a, leaving a country, you have to go through customs to get out of the country. If you're, if you're coming to a country, you have to go to the customs to get 
into the country. So that's what the thalamus does. And then what it does is it sort of sends things wherever it needs to go. Sends it here, sends it there, sends it there, sends it there. And that's what the thalamus does. It also says in here on this little thing, it says encloses that third ventricle. We can't see it, but sitting up in here on the uh, that C-shaped area would be what's called the lateral ventricle inside the cerebral hemisphere. And that lateral ventricle, like we talked about in the uh, lecture, will have, a, have a, a channel that drains into the area of the third ventricle. And uh, the ventricles in the brain are the areas that actually have tissues and cells, the choroid plexus, which actually makes the cerebral spinal fluid inside the brain. So that's the thalamus. We talked about that. You could go back and listen a little bit more in the lecture about what that's about. And then we look at the pituitary, the, whoops, did I miss the hypothalamus? I must have missed the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus. hypothalamus is below the area of the, here's the hypothalamus right here, and it's going to be right in this area right here, and that'd be the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus is critical, okay, because what it does is it samples everything, okay, where the thalamus sort of is a relay station, send things around. The hypothalamus says, okay, fine, I'll figure this out. Leave it to me. I'm going to take care of this. And the hypothalamus is actually part of the brain that's going to say, I'm going to, uh, oh, this is wrong. We need to fix it. This is wrong. We need to fix it. This is wrong. We need to fix it. This is okay. We're going to leave it alone. So the hypothalamus sort of coordinates what's going on. And all the um, uh, processes that are involved in homeostasis have to go through that area of the, of the hypothalamus. Okay. Now, in, I, the, the reason why I mention that is right sitting down below, which is circled now, is the pituitary gland. This area is the pituitary gland. Again, the pituitary is about the size of the tip of my little finger, about the size of a pea. And let me get rid of that line circling that. Let's get rid of where the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is that little, little. Oh, I better put, better put the hypothalamus back in there. Hypo, whoops, you don't see very much. Hypothalamus is sitting in here. But if you look down here between the hypothalamus and the pituitary, there's a stalk. Okay, and that stalk allows neural connection between the hypothalamus and the pituitary. And now we know that pituitary, if we remember back to the skull, sat in that cella tersica, in the hypotheseal fossa with the cella tersica coming up on both sides, high on both sides. So it sits inside that hypotheseal fossa, which is in the center of that area called the cella tersica. Okay? Uh, well, what happens is there's, there's a little membrane, okay? and that little membrane actually goes across right, like in here, goes across. And what happens is a small hole in that membrane and that nerve stalk goes down through there that goes to the pituitary. Uh, also, there's a rich vascular supply around the pituitary and to the area up through that stalk. So what happens is if the, if the hypothalamus says, we need to fix that, and the pituitary, which is called the master gland of the body, it sends out a signal through hormones, various hormones are called releasing factors, okay? And these hormone releasing factors will go to another gland somewhere else in the body, and that other gland will secrete the hormone that needs to be to be used. So, uh, let's say if my thyroid is down, uh, the hypothalamus will recognize that my thyroid is low. It sends a signal, a releasing factor, okay, uh, to the area uh, which is called actually called thyroid stimulating hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone, and the thyroid stimulating hormone then goes goes uh, or the goes to, uh, thyroid releasing hormone, excuse me, from the from the hypothalamus. Okay, thyroid releasing hormone from the hypothalamus goes to the pituitary. Then the pituitary sends out thyroid stimulating hormone. The thyroid stimulating hormone goes to the thyroid, and then the thyroid makes the thyroid hormones that will increase the metabolism. So the way we connect from the hypothalamus to the pituitary is either through a neural connection through the stalk, or because it has a lot of big vascular supply around there, the vessels, uh, various uh, chemical mediators will actually come from the hypothalamus down the down the down the vascular supply to that stalk they will actually get to the pituitary then the pituitary makes the hormone puts it in the system puts it in the, into the into the vascular system and that hormone goes to the goes to what's called a tar target gland and that target gland will then create the hormone that's supposed to do the job that the pituitary wants it to do so it's a sort of a roundabout way but it's actually quite effective okay so that's the pituitary gland that we see there uh, this over here is the midbrain now we talked about the midbrain it's a very 
difficult thing to, uh, to be to talk about about the peduncles, the the corporal quadrigemin. Uh, there's a number of different things in the midbrain, a number of different parts to it, and all those things are very important in regards to um, modulating and controlling and and maintaining and and getting things sort of uh, uh, correct the way they're supposed to be. So they th that's that's the midbrain, and you can go back and get a look at that in the in the lecture. We also have down here the pons okay the pons is below the midbrain so this area in here is going to be the pons the pons is going to be right there we talked about the pons in regards to some basic life functions you know a little bit of respirations and stuff like that okay below the pons we have the medulla oblongata that's this area right here a lot of the fibers that we have that's, that are in the right hemisphere will cross with the medulla oblongata and go to the left and go to wherever they need to go. But then medulla oblongata is really important. Uh, heart, heart rate, uh, blood pressure control, um, uh, much also influence with breathing, a number of different factors, alertness, all kinds of things like that are in the medulla oblongata. Uh, and it's a sort of a very critical portion. You gotta remember that what happens is right down in this area also is where I had that foramen magnum. So when somebody has a brain injury, the brain starts to swell, it takes the brain and forces it down against the um, frame and magnum. It's trying to force the brain because the, 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 the brain could only swell so much inside a closed container. Forces the brain down, tries to force it out through the hole, the frame and magnum. And guess what gets pushed against that frame and magnum? This whole area right in here. And that's the area that's really important for a lot of our critical functions that we that are autonomic functions that happen without us thinking about such as heart rate, breathing, respiration, you know, um, breathing, uh, blood pressure and stuff like that. That's why people will die from head injuries as the brain starts to go down. One of the things they do is when they have a person with a, with a head injury, one of the things that's commonly done is they give them something, a diuretic to try to relieve a lot of the fluid that will col collect or the edema, it's called cerebral edema. They try to get rid of that. Okay. And that's what they do with that. And there's the spinal cord. Once I'm down below the medulla oblongata, now we're out the frame and magnum and we head on down. I'll show you what that, what that spinal cord looks like in a little bit. Okay, a uh, couple things. We uh, the th uh, third ventricle. We walked there. There's the fourth ventricle. Fourth ventricle is in this area, and eventually, again, the we have the lateral ventricles, two, one on each side. They feed centrally to the third ventricle. Third ventricle feeds to the fourth ventricle below that, and from the fourth ventricle, it leads out through canals that go on to create the spinal fluid, or all the way around the brain and down the spinal cord in that subarachnoid space. Where? in the subarachnoid space. Okay, everybody with me? In the subarachnoid space, okay? And that's what that's where it all occurs from, okay? So there's the and oh, one thing I didn't I mentioned I mentioned very briefly in the lecture. It's called the corpus callosum, okay? Let me get rid of this stuff right here. What happens the corpus callosum is basically this area in here. And that's what actually connects it's sort of like a denser condition denser tissue that actually uh, keeps the two halves together. Okay, it's sort of like the area where they all come together, and that's called the corpus callosum. Okay, so that's what we see with that. This is just looking at a brain, a human brain. Again, if I'm trying to find those, you know, the the, the various uh, um, uh, the sulcus, you know, it's really difficult to see. It's not as easy. We could definitely, so we definitely know that this area is the frontal lobe. We definitely know this area is the parietal lobe. We definitely know this area is the occipital lobe. We definitely know this area is the temporal lobe. And we see the cerebellum down here. We see the medulla oblongata and the pond sitting up in here. But you know, sometimes looking at that fissure, that, that central sulcus, is this it right here? I don't know. The, uh, what they actually did is the way they mapped this is um, the, the brain, this is sort of cool, okay? The brain is insensitive. Okay. In other words, they can stick needles in the brain and you don't feel a whole lot. Okay. Unless you, but what happens is when they stick a needle into the brain, it causes something to happen. In other words, it stimulates the neurons to send out a signal. Okay. So a lot of times what happens in, in neurosurgery, they'll, what they'll do is they'll anesthetize the scalp and stuff like that, take off a big chunk of the skull, move the scalp, make a flap, and they'll sit there and they'll have the patient, they'll ask them, uh, what, do now? what do you feel 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 now? As they're moving probes around, okay, to be able to uh, uh, find where certain areas are that work in the brain. So the way they map the brain was basically by stimulating various areas and then finding out and saying, this is where we see this, this is where we see that, and that was where we see that. Other than that, the brain has very little sensation. Okay, and this is just looking at the brain over on this side. You see the whole thing, and this you see it cut in half. So this is like would be the right cerebral hemisphere. 
This area right here would be that corpus callosum. We see the pons, the medulla oblongata, cerebellum. Now you do see a fissure here. So this is the occipital lobe in here. Uh, we, it's hard to see where the lobe is in here for the parietal lobe, but the parietal lobe would be here. Frontal lobe would be here. And you can see the temporal lobe sitting down on the opposite side, sitting down in there, okay? So that's what we see in regards. So and a pituitary would be sitting right about here. The pituitary actually, if you find it, is like right behind the eye. So if we looked at where right in front of that hypophyseal fossa, you saw that little shelf, and that little shelf is where that optic chiasm, where part, half the optic nerves will actually cross to the other side, okay? And that's what we see. This is just looking at the bottom. And the reason why I put the bottom on here is not so much that we're going to spend a lot of time on it now. I'm not going to say what cranial nerve is this, what cranial nerve is that, what cranial nerve, but you see all these little strands that are, that are hanging out from it in various areas, okay? All these little strands are coming out. And those are cranial nerves, and they actually come directly from the brain. Here's the olfactory nerve, that long one right there, and that long one right there is the olfactory nerve. And if you look right here, that's the optic nerve. And this area right here in the middle is that optic chiasm where part of those fibers will cross, okay? Uh, part of the right, right eye goes to the left, part of the left eye goes to the right, but part of the right eye still goes to the right side, and part of the left eye still goes to the left. And this is the area where it crosses right there called the optic chiasm, C-H-I-A-S. M, chiasm, okay? That's that. But one other thing I really want to show you about, and this is going to come up uh, when we get get a little bit later now, is you keep, hard to see uh, how all of it, okay? But if you look right here, and let me put it, I'll put this in red still. This area right here, that's part of the basal artery, okay? And that what happens is, if you, you can't see it, but it's going to actually, right around right around that area, it's going to have that circle. And that circle is going to be that area what's called the Circle of Willis. Okay, And the Circle of Willis has a number of arteries that branch off. If you look right here, you can see something that looks like an opening of a tube. That's that middle cerebral artery. It's a monster artery. It's almost like a direct connection directly from the uh, internal carota that goes up through that through that uh, middle cerebral artery. There'll be one on this side as well. You just don't see it. But then that Circle of Willis is going around right in here. You see a couple little things sticking out right there? These are called. This is called the anterior cerebral. I think it goes through that actually the fissure because this is that part of the bottom, the launch two fissure from the bottom, and it'll supply this front, but this, the middle cerebral only supplies a small part of the brain, like like the whole sides and stuff like that. So anyway, I just want to show you because this, this area in here would be that area where we call the circle of wills, which we'll talk about a little bit more in the, in the next uh, section. Uh, want, a couple of last things I want to talk about before I let you go for this is this is again looking at the spinal cord pretty much we talked about before. And if I look, here's my spinal cord. The darker area in here is going to be the gray matter. Everything else out here is going to be the white matter. Okay, we know white matter is called white because it's a, it's a, it's a tract. Okay, it's their tracks of, uh, of, uh, um, of, of nerves. Okay, uh, and it, so the, it's like, a, a bunch of fibers that are coming together. And usually fibers that have to, a common thing are usually bundled together in various tracks. I can actually map the, the, the spinal cord as to what part of the spinal cord sends what type of fibers and what part of the spinal cord sends this type of fibers, what part of the spinal cord does this. And then we know that gray matter is mostly because of cell bodies that are sitting inside there. There's a split. So this is posterior, obviously, because here's, here's the spinous process. We know that this is a cervical vertebrae. How do I know that this is a cervical vertebrae? I know, and you know. Why? Is there any reason why you know this is a cervical vertebrae? Any reason? You think about it yet? Five. Four. Oh, you can't answer me, so you don't know. What happens? You, you know, but you can't talk. These are those foramen where the vertebral arteries, so the vertebral artery is going to go through here, vertebral artery is going to go through there. We talked about that uh, last time. Uh, so anyway, if you look inside here, let me see if I could draw it a different color right in here, that would be my subarachnoid space. That would be where the fluid is. So when I take a needle, that come in the needle, stick the tip of the needle in there, and I could draw the fluid off, okay? So if I look at this, this actually has a couple spaces. You know, so these are my meninges again. The pia is gonna be on the surface. The pia is gonna be stuck to the surface of the, of the spinal cord. The arachnoid is stuck to the bottom side of the dura, and the dura is the tougher membrane that's on the outside. There's usually some fat and stuff like that that contain that, that holds the, the dura uh, and separates the dura from the rest of, of the vertebrae, okay? A uh, couple things I just wanna mention here that I think are, are sort of helpful is number one, 
if we talk about the dura and we go outside the dura right where the dura is which is this layer oops i can't do it with my pen the outside layer let me get rid of that i can't see that a whole lot follow the follow the pointer okay if you look out in here see that, that the gray okay let's see if i could do it well, i'll do it white maybe i could do it white ah that area okay that would be the dura and everything that would be outside the dura okay everything that would be outside the dura would be called extra dural extra means outside okay so sometimes people have an extra dural hematoma which means that they bleed if it was in the skull they'd bleed between the dura and the, and the skull itself because it's outside the dura okay then we have what's called the subdural space that subdural space is right where the dura meets the arachnoid and because of the pressure it will separate the separate the dura from the arachnoid and so it'll be bleeding in there it's usually venous blood from the dural from the from venous sinuses and stuff like that and then what happens is we have what's called the subarachnoid space and that subarachnoid space is that space between the arachnoid and the pia and that's where the cerebral spinal fluid would be in that subarachnoid space okay a couple things i just want to show you in regards to a nerve okay so this is posterior and this is anterior okay anterior and posterior what happens is we have this is where the spinal nerve is going to be coming out spinal nerve whoops ah, darn it don't want to do that okay anyway i can't go back if the spinal nerve com, nerves nerve comes out okay what happens is where the spinal nerve is it's both mixed it's motor sensory as well as autonomic all in the same fibers in the same spinal nerve as it leaves dorsally or posteriorly and anteriorly or ventrally okay what happens is the root the nerve that comes in there is called the dorsal root the dorsal root the dorsal root is for sensory nerves it's for sensory nerves dorsal root for sensory nerves okay the one on the other side okay it's in the green right here is the ventral root the ventral root is for motor it's for motor fibers okay what happens is the sensory fibers are going to be going in the motor fibers are going to be going out so when we finally get to that spinal nerve i have some fibers that are leaving some fibers that are coming in okay and that's what we see also usually what happens is on that area of the dorsal root there's usually a lump somewhere in here and it's called the dorsal root ganglion now ganglion is like we talked about in the in the lecture is a clump of of cell bodies so what happens is what happens the nerve will come down by an axon and goes to all uh, this clump of cell bodies in the dorsal root and then continues on the other side and goes to the spinal cord from there it either goes back out the motor in like a reflex you know like when you tap on the knee and you get the reflex it's very short it doesn't even go to the brain or it'll go up one of the tracks there'll be tracks all over through the whole spinal cord and it goes up to the brain okay so either that sensory comes in goes through the dorsal root ganglion which is out in here continues on through the axon to the area of the spinal cord and goes up to the brain or in a case of a reflex it just takes a right turn goes back to where it came from and causes a motor action which is fast that way that way reflexes actually happen quite fast this is just looking at an anatomical picture here where that they, where they've done a cross section obviously this is a cervical okay why because there's the air from a cervical or my vertebral artery vertebral artery and so what you do is you actually see here's the spinal cord this is the gray matter in here in the middle and all this other stuff out here is the white matter and you can see the so so you can see the area of the dorsal root ganglion and stuff like that here's the vertebral body so i know that's anterior so this is anterior oh, you can't see that very well here here's anterior this is posterior this way and so as a result this is the dorsal root that's a dorsal root dorsal root here would be ventral sometimes they call it the anterior posterior rami rami anterior rami posterior rami or ventral root dorsal root okay and again that posterior rim or the dorsal root is sensation that ventral root or the anterior ramus is called is motor okay and that's what we see now this is just looking at the spinal cord okay a couple things i want to mention about the spinal cord is what happens is um, i have 31 pairs of spinal nerves 31 pairs okay well guess what i don't have 31 vertebrae i have one extra and that one extra is because i have eight in the cervical region i have seven cervical vertebrae seven cervical vertebrae but i have eight spinal nerves 
okay, eight spinal nerves in the cervical region. So here's my cervical region. Well, first of all, again, the dura and arachnoid and stuff like that are going to surround the, 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 the cord. Uh, here's my spinal, cervical spinal nerves. I have C, C1 through C8 at that point. Then I have my 12 thoracic. Going through the thoracic area, I have the lumbar area, five lumbar, and then I have five sacral. That actually, what will do is that what they'll do is that actually, um, uh, you know, come out through those holes. The sacrum we know is solid, so those these holes, those frame, and we talked about in the sacrum that will allow those things to come out. So, and then have a coccygeal nerve on the bottom, which will give me 31. Now, one thing I just want to mention is called the conus modularis. Uh, conus medullaris, okay? Now, the conus medullaris. People think the spinal cord goes all the way down, but it doesn't. I mentioned this before. What happens? The spinal cord actually stops around L2, L3, okay, somewhere in that range. And what happens, the spinal cord comes down and it bulges out a little bit, okay, bulges out a little bit and creates like a cone. And this is called the conus medullaris, where it bulges out, okay, conus medullaris. So that's the end of the spinal cord as a solid structure as we know it, okay. From that point on, we have all these nerves that come down in strands, they come out through the bottom of the spinal cord. In other words, if the spinal cord continued out, there'd be one coming out here, one coming out here, one coming out here, but they're all together and they'll go out the respective, the right hole through the vertebrae. This area down here is called the cauda equina. Cauda means tail, equina means horse, okay? So that's that. One other thing I do want to mention in here is called the film terminale, okay? And what happens is from the bottom of that conus medullaris, there's a band of tissue. Whoops, I hate that when that happens band of tissue that comes straight down. It sort of comes straight down that area and attaches down in here. So it holds the spinal cord down where it's supposed to, provides a little bit of traction, almost like a rope holding in the right position. And that's called the film terminology.